Hello everybody, my name is Eric. Today we've got two Windows XP computers right here. I might have to upload this video in a slightly weird aspect ratio so that you can see both of them. I'll decide. I could either do that or I could do like a multicam edit in 800 by 600. So we got these uh, two VMs here, both running VirtualBox, and they're both networked with each other, which means they can actually see each other. I've actually got a third VM, I can just briefly drag that on, that's running PFSense that makes this whole system work. Now, I have turned off the connection to the outside world because I didn't want these systems to accidentally start DDoSing something. But before that, the PFSense setup did enable connection to the outside world. So here we're going to get the sample. Now, Blaster is a network. If you remember my very popular Windows XP to the internet video where we allowed attackers on the internet to exploit a vulnerability, and that was just through pure serendipity. I mean, I didn't know what was going to happen. But here we've got these two Windows XP computers networked with each other, and this is Windows XP Service Pack 0, which means we don't have to turn off the firewall because it's actually off by default. They did add it. I don't know why it was off by default. We're kind of on the fence about whether to ship it or not. We can actually find it here under Internet Connection Firewall. But by default, it's not enabled, and we're not going to enable it. Not that it would matter on a local network. But if this was a full internet, it would matter. So we got these two systems. So let's see what happens. I always find networms interesting because they're the closest. They 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 feel almost magical. You know, you run like you plug your computer in to the internet, and it just gets hacked. There, there's no clicking. There's no things happening. So we can see we just ran that. Let's see, it's using some CPU. We can see that it is running, although we can't see exactly what it's doing. And we can look is uh, running Windows XP. We don't have any service packs installed. We have the 2002 version, which and it sees all of the hardware. Well, let's open up Task Manager on here just to see if anything starts to happen. We can also ping the other computer to show that it is reachable. Let me see, it gets a low ping time. And we can even create a network share. And Blaster will also install itself so that it'll keep coming back. So if we reboot, It'll be there waiting for us. We do have a second blaster that I'm going to try because I'm not sure the first one's working as expected. Now we've got blaster E going. Oh, it looks like something just happened. Yup, and this is how you know that blaster has infected you. So because the exploit in the remote procedure call system... Now I think we also saw this, I made a similar video in my Windows XP with Windows 2000, which is also vulnerable. Oh, and then Blaster on here, and this was apparently, and I think there is a, supposed to be a patch for this, but one of the problems with this worm, and why it ultimately, because it's intended payload, and that's why it's called Blaster, was to DDoS Windows Update. Ultimately, they DDoSed a secondary domain that Microsoft simply took down and eliminated the problem, but this malware was still quite disruptive, because it would do this. So Blaster infected this virtual machine, which then scans everything on the network and infected this virtual machine. And we're going to let both of these reboot and we're going to see what happens. But basically they're going to keep doing this. Now we can check in this one. mslaugh.exe. And there we go. This one has already started shutting down again. And let's see, uh, have we... Yeah, our copy of Blaster is running, so pretty quickly, this one should go down. So that was the main inconvenience. It's kind of funny to watch these guys fighting it out. Now, one thing I am kind of curious about, just to validate this, because to my understanding, the crash comes from the system reinfecting itself. So if we have only one system with Blaster installed, does it still crash? No, it seems like it doesn't. So then you could theoretically fix this problem by removing the networking. So that was actually the main harm caused by Blaster, isn't even the intended effect, which was mostly useless, but the fact that it would DDoS itself and friends in it would basically denial of service your computers, and in an enterprise network this could cause real problems. Now we're going to do some analysis, but first let me just tell you about today's sponsor who can help keep your business safe from modern threats before we continue our dive into this historical threat. Malware keeps evolving, getting stealthier, leaner, and harder to detect. That is why this video is sponsored by ThreatLocker, the zero trust system that denies by default. Instead of chasing every possible threat, ThreatLocker flips the model. 
You choose what's allowed and it blocks everything else without explicit approval. How it works. Three easy steps. Step one, install ThreatLocker. It starts in learning mode, observing the software you need. Step two, let it learn. It maps the apps, scripts, and services your team actually uses. Step three, lock it down. Switch to protected mode and anything unrecognized is denied by default. ThreatLocker maintains a live list of approved applications, so the updates you trust keep working, and its patch management suite tells you when unpatched software puts your business at risk. And it doesn't stop at allow or deny. With application level ring fencing, you can lock applications to specific folders and resources, remove internet access from tools that don't need it, and control exactly how approved software is allowed to behave. Ready to move from reactive to proactive security? Strengthen your organization's security posture today at threatlocker.com slash Eric Parker. So now to finish up, I did just want to go over the analysis of how this actually works. Now this was done by a man called Robert Graham, and this is purely for educational purposes. And remember, this is not modern malware. This is not useful for anything today. We're purely going to look at this for the sake of a historical perspective on what was an extremely problematic historical threat. B.U. Ford is the pseudonym of the hacker who wrote this. Basically, the way this was made is using Ida Pro, probably quite an old version given this work was done uh, decades ago. This person decompiled it, which gives an imperfect decompilation. Then they marked it up and made it so that it's more of a realistic decompilation. Then there was a second person who was actually caught, Jeffrey Lee Parson. He was from Minnesota. Now, he didn't create Blaster, but he, using a hex editor slightly modified it so that he could turn it into a rat. And as an example of the damage that was caused here, the blaster worm and its uh, cousins, Welch is kind of interesting, uh, caused a power blackout because they got in an essentially denial of service computers that controlled a power plant. So that's why this can be serious, even though the payload wasn't that bad. Now Welchia, also known as Nichi, was supposed to be a helpful worm. Now, it uses the same exploit, but it's actually supposed to get rid of Blaster, and then it will download patches. So it's been called a helpful worm. The problem is, the destruction from Blaster isn't really the DDoS payload, it's the crashing of your computer, which Welchia also does. So that, that's why this one is also considered to be malware. So we can see the headers, WinSock, WinSocket2, WinINet, SDIO, and we got these again. Well, these are kind of funny. I just want to say, I love you, San. Now, I would kind of wonder if that's a reference to the Japanese honorific, maybe? And then Billy Gates. This is the most infamous one. Billy Gates, why do you make this possible? Stop making money and fix your software. <laughs> Throwing an insult with Bill Gates. msblast.exe. Uh, the version I showed you had a different name. This is the DCOM port. And yes, firewall blocking this would fix the problem. And then that's how it gets the stage two, gets its own file name, and then it starts the thread for DOSing, the spreading, and the exploit. So this is the main function. Now it also checks the month and day, and that's because the DDoS only runs at certain times. And here's the persistence mechanism. But here it calls itself Windows Auto Update to fool people. And it also has anti-reinfection because if it reinfected itself, it could break. Now, as we saw, it does the exploit run. So it doesn't, it's not fully resilient. Uh, interestingly, if you saw my Windows XP analysis video, that worm did have a mechanism to stop it from, it, it would block the port so that it wouldn't get exploited again. And here's a workaround for dial-up users, because this was the era when both dial-up was still common and before IPv4 scarcity got so bad that this kind of networm was no longer able to spread over the internet because everything was NATed. And here is the code to get the local IP address by the first victim, and then it can use this to figure out the class B, which is how it will infect the local network. And this is probably why the first time we tried it, it didn't work, and why it didn't crash every time. Because if it tried to ex scan the internet, it would fail, because we didn't have... Uh, I turned that off. And also, it would be a waste of bandwidth, because there's not going to be a single internet-connected computer that is vulnerable to this, and if there is, it wouldn't be up for very long. And the DOS will run on these dates. So today, it would run. And this is the... Uh, code that copies it over. Incre this is 
the spreader, and this is how the actual vulnerability works. Now what's kind of interesting is this was actually developed and discovered by a Chinese ethical researcher. Xfocus discovered it from Microsoft. They were doing the bin diff on each Windows update, and they discovered a fix for this vulnerability, which allowed them to figure out what the mistake was that was fixed. And that's how this exploit that caused this whole mess came into existence. Shows, especially in the old days when security updates weren't quite as prevalent, even if ethical actors found the exploit first, it could still get exploited in the wild. And that is one of the reasons why Microsoft has made the controversial decision of forcing security updates. Because a lot of people say, oh, I don't need security updates. Uh, yes, you do. Mm, the TFTP part of the program. I really do appreciate the commentary here that this researcher provided. And it sends an incredibly slow 15 kilobits a second DDoS, which meant dial-up users could still do it. But of course, if a million computers get infected, you've now got a massive problem. Especially 20 years ago, when there was a lot less bandwidth than there is now. And there it is. So this is a really cool... Thing. And please let me know in the comments below. A lot of people really liked the previous classic malware, so please let me know if you want to see more classic malware. We'll do sort of we'll run it, and then we'll go over how it worked. Uh, let me know if you got any feedback about this format. That's all from me for now. Bye.